Chair uh, Berkeley Allen of the uh, Metro Council's Finance Committee, and I have with me Councilmember Zulfat Sawara, my Vice Chair, and our two speakers for tonight, who I'll introduce in just a second. I'm going to move down to the other mic so I can run my very short slideshow, and then we'll get to the real meat of the meeting. We appreciate people tuning in. I just want to provide a little bit of context as we go through these uh, these two months of meetings that we have set up. Um, first of all, I want to provide the the very large picture based on this year's budget of where um, where our money comes from, which is what we're focusing on for these two weeks in December. Um, not to get bogged down in very um, very fine percentages, but just to show that the vast majority of our um, funding comes from property taxes. And then there are um, other large parts that come from local option sales tax and grants and contributions, and that's what we're going to be focusing on tonight. Uh, and there are also other revenues that um, that may be come up as we as we discuss with our, our two speakers, um, the two largest ones. And then uh, again, just a large overview of where the money goes. Again, you can see that um, education is the the largest single component of what we spend the city's money on. And then that is followed by public safety and justice. And then uh, the next two pieces are our debt service and general government. And then there are other categories such as infra infrastructure, transportation, recreation and culture, and health and social services. So we will set up our, um, our January sessions based on those categories, starting with the largest ones. So here's the schedule now. Uh, last week we talked about property taxes. This week is sales tax and downtown revenue and grants. And next week, uh, I'm sorry, in January, we'll come back and talk about where we spend the money beginning with Metro Schools since that's the largest section of what we spend. And then public safety, infrastructure, parks, health and social services. Uh, and then we'll have a session on debt service and general government. And then in the month of February, we will have some community panel discussions um, with different groups hopefully uh, to give everyone a chance to ask uh, the many questions that come up about how our budget works and how people can participate in that. So with that, um, at the end, we'll take questions after each speaker, and you can watch previous videos at the Metro's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Metro Nashville. And with that, I will begin with my next speaker, Mary Jo Wiggins. from Metro Finance. All right, I think that's... Great, thank you, Chair Allen. Oops, am I on? Yeah. Um, so thank you for the opportunity for um, Metro Finance to present just a little bit about grants. So the process within Metro is that when a department identifies a grant that they are interested in pursuing, um, they do have to first file a resolution uh, for that um, application to be approved by the Metro Council. Um, it, it really keeps departments, um, it's kind of a nice check and balance, keeps departments from kind of avoiding any kind of mission creep or getting into a grant that maybe is not the best fit um, or more importantly, not sustainable. Um, if we're entering into new expenditures or programs that we can't sustain beyond the grant, we want to make sure that it's something we really want to do. So um, it's very rare to not receive that approval, but it is a good um, check and balance and a required step. So once the grant has been actually then awarded, um, then the department must again file another resolution to receive the funds from the council um, essentially, they're seeking approval to sign that grant contract, and so then they accept the funds. We do this process even for in-kind um, grants. Um, an emphasis is always made to ensure that the grant funds are considered one time, or if there is a history of a recurring grant, um, then we know which programs we can continue to operate year to year. Um, something else that we look for is that many grants require an internal match. Oftentimes, that match can be met through our own staffing expenses. So salaries and wages for the individuals that are running the program is often an acceptable match um, by the grantor. Um, and then in some cases, if it has been a recurring grant, 
um, the match is known and it's included in the budget. So any match has to be already in the budget um, when we accept the grant funds. So that's a little bit about the process. And what I did provide, uh, let's see if I can enlarge this a little bit. Oh, um, not with the technical people that are in this room. If, uh, if, um, if someone wanders in, we will make that request. Um, and I can get, I'm sorry, I actually printed copies and didn't bring them. I knew it was we do be. have printed copies. If you stick around, we might be able to provide those, or I can email it to you. Yep. Um, so what I did was just wanted to show both FY21 and FY20. Probably the largest grants that are coming through Metro in both of those years are going to be the CARES Act grant and the American Rescue Plan. So let me just go to the bottom of this, and what you'll see is that in um, FY20, we had $172 million in grants come through Metro, but $121 million of that was the, um, the CARES Act. It was the, the, specifically $121 million was the Coronavirus Relief Fund. The CRF is what we refer to as the local government support that Metro received. It does not include additional funds that came through the CARES Act that were directly to other agencies, but the largest components of those other agencies were MNPS, the airport, um, MTA, RTA, which are not in these totals. So to really kind of um, adjust the FY20 total, we backed out that 120 million, 121 million to be exact. In FY21, um, even though we haven't received the cash, for 260 million, the American Rescue Plan Act allocation to Metro has been um, approved to be received by the Metro Council in the whole 260 million. So in this $370 million total, 260 of that is for the state and local fiscal recovery fund. Again, that state and local fiscal recovery fund, which you see as SLFRF, is just that local government piece. Similar to the CARES Act, um, there are other funding for related metro agencies, but again, that's schools, MTA, RTA, the airport, things that are not reported in these totals. Also in FY20, um, a large component though of the American Rescue Plan was Emergency Rental Assistance Program. So we call it the acronym ERAP, that's about $43 million, and that's why you'll see under the Metro Action Commission, $55 million. I highlighted that, that in red. Um, about $43 million of that is the ERAP. Um, and then the last thing when you see highlighted up here in red um, for the finance department, the finance department does not typically receive any operating grants, but um, in addition to the $260 million for the American Rescue Plan. We are also processing the um, recovery of the federal funds from FEMA, which actually comes from TEMA as a grant. So there's an additional 16 million from FEMA that's included in that year. So if I back that out and we really adjust to take out all of those federal funds, we're actually at, uh, at a really pretty um, comparable amount year over year. And essentially, if you look at that as roughly $50 million in grants on an annual basis of our $2.5, $2.6 billion budget, grants make up roughly 2% of, of our funding. And um, I think the count was in FY20, we had 22 departments receive funds. In FY21, there were 24 departments. So there aren't any... Um, the, the largest amount you see for a department, Parks and Recreation in FY21 had nearly six million, but four million of that was from the conservancy uh, for Centennial Park. So again, kind of a unique one time. Um, we don't really um, have significant operating funds that run through our budget that are related to grants. Like I said, about 2%. Um, a, a really common occurrence is with our health department. There is a lot of um, state 
funding. Some of it is federal that passes through state um, that they receive for different programs. Those are very ongoing um, programs, very um, common for them to receive those same grants over and over. But again, we really try to not have departments rely on grant funding because it's never guaranteed year to year. And we don't want to create programs that we can't continue without that grant. So um, in, in the whole scheme of things and materiality, that 50 million would be about 2% of our operating budget. Are there any questions that I could answer? Um, we have invited the, the viewing audience that is present in the chamber to write questions on the um, index cards that have been passed out and, and Vice Chair Suara will pick up those cards if there are. And while she's checking, um, I, I would like to ask one question, if I might, too, actually. Um, just to follow up with, with what you just said, on the pie chart, which comes directly out of the budget book, um, it shows grants and contributions um, is about 12 to 13 percent of the budget, um, if I remember. So what, what's the, the, the rest of that um, 12 to 13 percent beyond this 2 percent, 50 million that is um, what you've shown here is the typical amount of grants that we, that we get? Um, I'm not sure that I can, off the top of my head, get you a complete answer on the other contributions. Um, they wouldn't fall under grants. Um, and, and they wouldn't include the ARP. Um, I, it, it's important to say that the American Rescue Plan and the CARES Act funds have never been incorporated into our budget. They are really considered one time and not being used for ongoing or recurring budget items. We do have things like um, land sales, um, one-time transactions. There can be um, contributions from other related components um, of, of Metro that, that will flow through those other contributions. But I would be happy to get you a more detailed um, okay. accounting of that. That would be helpful to understand. And Council Member Suara, you've got a, a question from the, from the audience. Yes, yes. And I've got your mic. Thank you, Chair. The question is, how does this compare to comparable cities? So I, I can't speak specifically um, to um, any specific city, but in general, um, we've made the observation that that is, that is not a very significant number for a city our size. There is probably um, more opportunity for other um, grant funds uh, again, four programs and specific um, specific areas of our work um, that that may be available. Um, it's something that we've observed that we don't have a dedicated grant team. Um, I really give credit to our metro departments that are able to identify some of these grants. A lot of what they identify comes through their own um, associations within their department expertise. So if they for example, our libraries as part of being part of, you know, a, a, a nationwide network of libraries and museum of science, you know, they, um, they, they identify those on their own. We don't have a dedicated team that goes after grants. Thank you. I've, I've heard uh, previous council members point that out and, um, and, and ask if that's a position that we might want to budget for. So that's a, that's a, a good observation to make. Um, Another question that, that came up that is not necessarily related to the grants part of, of our income, but it does need to be answered by the finance department. So before I let you go, sure. um, there was a question asked um, about property taxes. Um, so this actually would have been a Tom Edelman question last week. And the question was, as we um, get new, new properties being built, and there are plenty of those happening right now, um, what do we expect um, additional income from those new properties to bring in so that, you know, what, what do we think that that growth will actually um, add to our budget in the, in the coming year? So I know that's not necessarily your area, area of expertise, but. Yeah, it's not. And um, I can see, I, I, let me just check and see if I have an email on that. Okay, we had, we had asked that one earlier. And I know in previous years, we've seen something along the lines of between 50 and 75 in some years, but I'd rather, I'd rather have it from the finance department if you, if you did get a response on that yeah, one. Yeah, so I know somebody was going to look at that. Um, 
I can't give you any kind of estimate going forward, but what we've done historically is been able to look at the trend and using um, you know, some of the information such as building permits and information from codes and that we know what new construction so that we can make estimates, but we really work with the assessor's office to make those estimates of what we think the new property tax revenue will be on what was construction and process that, you know, in the previous years. So um, we've, we've used historical trends and the previous year's data from, you know, building permits codes, the assessor's office. So um, I will follow up on those two items if it's okay. Okay. Or Alan, I'll send that to you. Um, if there's a way to then post that. We can do that. Okay. Absolutely. That would be that would be helpful. I've seen I've seen 50 million. I think there was there was one year where it was close to 100 million, and um, I, I would expect it to bounce somewhere between those. But getting from authority would be would be good. Any other questions, Councilmember Swara? Use mic. Okay. The only thing that I wanted to ask Ms. Mary Jo is that in looking at the uh, comparison between last year and this year, I know the overall amount is similar, but there were some new grants in there. There were some departments that got grants for the first time this year. Did you look to see if the, are those recurring? Are those part of the uh, federal grants or those are just new grants, new money coming in that we may have the possibility of uh, getting again next year? So some of these could still be CARES Act and ARP related throughout the two years. Um, and I do recall there was some specific funding, uh, for example, for the election commission during our most recent election. So that might be funding that comes to them every four years, right? So depending on, because of the um, attention to our national election. So um, some of these may be one time. Um, again, the, the departments that you see with the larger numbers are more the recurring type that are running programs. The rest of them could really be one time. Some of them could still be related to our um, CARES Act and rescue plan. And, and following up on that, how much, how much longer does the CARES Act or, or American Rescue Plan funding um, flow? Do we expect to see some of that in the next couple of years or, or does it end at the end of, 20, of fiscal 2022? So in, um, in, in um, fiscal 20, we received the $121.1 million, and the original expiration of those funds was 1231.20. Actually, it was 1230.20. And we did, um, it, we, we spent all of those funds by that date. Um, on December 27th of 2020, um, they actually passed a second stimulus package that extended that expiration to 1231-21. So we have continued to see how much we could um, apply for FEMA re reimbursement related to COVID. And then if we are able to, the council passed a um, resolution that says any funds that we can, that we can essentially save from FEMA would either go back into public safety salaries to continue to create expenditure that creates reserve, or if that exceeded the original estimate of 29.8 million, we would bring that back to council. So we have until 1231-21 to finalize those expenditures and then really know how much that final reserve was. And the reserve then can be spent until it's finished. It's already appropriated for very specific items. So it has to be spent on those items. Um, but anything beyond that, then we would bring back to council. So um, there's really no more um, spending happening of the CARES Act. Um, it, it officially, those funds from the CRF expire on 1231 and then we'll be working on final reporting for, for almost another year. There are quarterly reports knowing um, that cities are, you know, again, having to get everything in the right bucket and prepared for audit. On the American Rescue Plan, the 260 million that's been allocated to Metro was received, um, will be received in two years. So we received the first installment of a, almost 130 million um, this past summer and we will receive the second installment um, next summer, a year later. 
so summer of 22. The funds have to be obligated by 1231-24. So, and then spent by 1231-26. So as we continue to make recommendations through the oversight committee that are presented to council, those funds will continue to be appropriated until all 260 million has been appropriated. Um, those funds won't flow through the budget though. So as you were saying, you know, in that pie chart, we won't see the fun funds flowing through the budget, but we will see them, you know, being expensed out of the fund that they're received in. Um, they are held in a separate bank account, accounted for in a separate fund, and we'll con continue to see those expenditures happen, uh, most likely all the way through 1231-26. So quite a few years. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Council Member Mendez. Thanks. Um, I've got a question and then just, um, uh, I know last week was property tax, but you brought it up and I just had a comment about that. Um, the question, and um, you know, the federal government keeps pushing out, uh, we've talked about CARES and American Rescue Plan, but there's continues to be very, very large programs. And um, I think people would be interested to know what we're doing as a city to make sure that we're there to jump through whatever hoops apply for whatever we have to apply for. Um, and I, I know this is a, a work in progress um, for y'all in finance, um, but um, I, I think s some some description of what's going on and and giving people um, the comfort that we're we're being aggressive and trying to get um, wh whatever ends up in all these packages. Could you comment on that? Yeah, the, so the, the biggest one that's coming first would be the Infrastructure um, Act, so the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. And, um, and I will say, again, it does rely a bit to the departments and to that level of expertise. Um, the administration um, really is focused on it. We also work with the state, so a lot of the infrastructure is going, um, infrastructure funding will actually go through the state. So unlike the CARES Act and the rescue plan that had um, kind of automatic calculations to the local governments, these allocations are all gonna go to the state. And then the state will either have a formula for distributing or an application process. So um, a lot of the main areas will be in our um, transportation, so NDOT, um, and I, I can specifically say that I know that uh, Faye Massimo is really focused on what those opportunities are. Um, and, and we have a great um, relationship with um, Congressman Cooper's office to make sure that we find out what those opportunities are in applications. So um, the process really, I think, is in that relationship with knowing what's available at the state level and when those funds will be available. So things that we do also might be making sure that we have um, MOUs in place, we're looking at things like, can we have matching funds available in our CSP? There, there was some of that that happened that was just passed to make sure that we had funds available so that if we have to apply with matching funds, we have them available. Um, and then just briefly on the property tax, um, yeah, I, I'm glad we're gonna get the answer about um, if there's, if it's known yet, what if there's a projection about the increase in property tax revenue um, for um, the new fiscal year next summer. Um, I, I'm under the impression that usually comes up in January or February, so it might be a little early to get it. But I wanna make sure um, that people focus on, the, these numbers get enormous um, and the zeros can be confusing. You, you know, we in government end up, you know, cav relatively cavalierly throwing out, well, you know, revenue might increase 50 million, 100 million, somewhere in there, and that sounds, astronomical, um, but if you took four zeros off and and you were a family with a $25,000 budget, we're talking about the equivalent of 500 or 1,000 more up to 25,500 or 26,000. And anybody who's got to deal with increase in costs straight across the board for um, inflation and uh, you know the car's always wearing out, and you got to buy new muffler, or new whatever for the car, and appliances, etc. Knows that it's not really that life-changing to go from 
25,000 to 26,000 dollars worth of income. And even though there's four more zeros to go from 2.5 billion to 2.6 billion, we still have, we might have tens of millions of dollars worth of inflation. Um, we are hundreds of millions of dollars behind on um, just getting our schools adequately um, uh, up to date on their capital needs. Um, you know, bus service, we've, we have expanded bus service using federal money that will go away after a couple of years. And so I just want to reinforce any, any talking about um, the revenue going up, you know, tens of millions of dollars on property taxes has to come at the same time with, and it's pretty much gone, especially with inflation running the way it is, almost right off the bat um, as uh, I mean, it sounds crazy because the numbers are so big, but take off four zeros and it, it makes more sense. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Appreciate you pointing that out. Good, good question. Any other questions for finance director? If you have, have one, right? Oh, I think we do have one. One more. We appreciate that. One more question and then we'll... Then we'll move on to income tax. So this question is on the prioritization of grants. Is there, are there any existing guidance from Metro non-departmental on which private or public grants should be pursued? I don't know, I, I don't believe that there is just as we don't have a central source that is out looking for grants or in, in those words, either prioritizing because it falls within each department. I think the departments look at what's available that is consistent with their operations, a program that they're already running that they can get funding for. Um, there's, there's just not that ability to go after a grant for something new if there's not you know, um, an, an assurance that this is a recurring grant. When it's one time, it's just less likely to get a foothold. Um, and again, um, we run pretty lean. And so departments, I have to say, unfortunately, probably prioritizing grants isn't even at the top of their priorities. Again, that's kind of why I would say I go back to, there's probably more opportunities than we're able to actually, um, you know, dig into just because of capacity. So um, I, I wish we were sophisticated enough to be prioritizing which grants. I think we go after all the ones that we know of that, that fit well. And so will it be safe to say that because we don't have a central grant office going after grants, then the compliance on the grants itself also falls on the departments? Um, Yes, but there is also a finance uh, component to that. So we have a Office of Financial Accountability that reviews all contracts and grants are considered a contract. We also have a division within that group, um, a division of grants and contracts um, that does make sure that reporting is, um, is submitted, invoices are submitted, um, and then there is an um, it's, it's not an audit by official audit standards. We sometimes call them audits. It's a review of the contract to make sure that the terms were met, that if they were um, whatever the program requirements of how many were served or um, who received the funding, different requirements of that, that those were all achieved. So there, there, is, there is good compliance of our contracts. Thank you, we appreciate that. Um, Ms. Wiggins, we appreciate you coming and representing finance and Absolutely. educating us on the grants portion of our income. And I know you have another uh, another engagement, so we'll uh, we'll let you know if other questions come up. We'll we'll send them by email. Excellent, and I will get those two responses back to Great. you for distribution. Thank you so Thank much. You. And with that, I would like to welcome Councilmember Bob Mendez, who is Councilmember at Large, former Budget Chair, um, and Contract Whiz in general, and he's going to talk about. Um, our income from sales tax, and I hope a little bit about specifically um, income related to the downtown area and what actually comes into Metro and where where it goes um, otherwise. Uh, that is not what you're supposed to be seeing. <laughs> Ooh. Um, yes, can you text Rosie and tell her we need to unlock the PC?
All right, we will wait for our, um, when we get the right screen, it'll be over there in the right-hand corner and you'll be good to go, but we're not there yet. Um, our, our tech support is running. You email them. Yeah. Why don't you log in to your account and then pull it up? I don't know how to do that. My computer signs me on automatically. Ah. I couldn't tell you my password to save my life. Right. This one may have Rosie's names. Yeah, do you want, can you text her? Well, and council member, I can, um, I can start in um, okay. some of it, assuming we'll get this resolved. Oh. I mean, I think, I think for some of the later slides, it, it will be helpful, but. Um, okay, I'm gonna let you start. I will, I will try to send a text message. We'll double team and. Uh, All right. If you um, can begin, we'll, we'll try to have video by the time you get to when you need it. All right. Um, Thanks, and uh, I appreciate you putting on this series. Um, and so I'm here to talk about uh, sales tax and downtown revenue um, related to sales tax. And the starting point um, is to really understand how sales tax is split between the city and state. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I, I hear often um, from folks is, you know, we've got all these tourists in town buying up uh, barbecue and um, cowboy boots and beer and buying all sorts of stuff, so we should have piles of money. Um, you know, one thing to understand is right off the bat that the state gets the lion's share of sales tax, not Metro. And um, the first slide, um, uh, which you guys will be okay without seeing, I promise, um, lays out what the maximum allowed sales tax is, both for the state part and what's called the local option that we keep here in Nashville. Um, and so what state law says is that the state's portion is 7% of sales and that cities and counties can charge up to 2.75% in addition to that. So the total allowed under Tennessee state law is 9.75 with most of it staying with the state. In Metro, we do not have that maxed out. Um, we have the allowed, what, what would be allowed by the state is 2.75% and we've got two and a quarter percent um, for our local option. So the total sales tax inside Davidson County on purchases is 9.25%. Again, 7% to the state, 2.25 um, for us here locally. Um, and I, I would mention that, um, first of all, uh, a lot of us um, believe that Sales tax is very regressive, meaning it impacts people with lower income uh, more um, disproportionately highly. Uh, but this, this is the hand we're dealt by the state of Tennessee. Um, we've got a state where there is no state income tax, and so state law is designed to force um, cities and counties to get most of their revenue from property tax and sales tax with no boost from income tax. And um, so, we we don't we don't uh, we don't have a lot of options on the local option, um, and so we're at 2.25 percent. Um, conventional wisdom inside the courthouse for a number of years has been that that last available portion of sales tax, that last half percent that we don't use, um, is. Uh, uh, potentially available to use if there's ever a transit referendum. Um, the transit referendum that was um, set a couple years ago that lost, I think 2018, I'm not sure the years run together, um, but that would have um, maxed out the sales tax and, and designated the additional last half cent of sales tax toward um, dedicated funding for transit. Um, so just keep your eye on that if we have a referendum in the future. Um, all right, so point number one was just to focus everybody on the lion's share sales tax goes to the state, the state spends it, never makes its way to Nashville. Um, for Nashville sales tax that we get to spend um, to run our city um, is about, is 2.25% of sales. The next slide, which I would have liked for y'all to have seen, um, tracks, um, hopefully we still get it up, uh, tracks what the sales tax revenue has been um, since 2011, so you can see the progression of it. Um, I'll mention some of the numbers. Um, in 2011, 
sales tax, local option sales tax, so our two and a quarter percent was at um, $258 million. In 2021, a decade later, it was $481 million. So 258 to 481 over the course of a decade, that is a significant increase that does reflect the city being substantially larger and having a substantial um, uh, tax base downtown. Um, a couple of caveats on that. The percent that sales taxes of overall revenue hasn't really changed during that time period. All throughout this period, sales tax ends up being about 20% of the city's revenue. That's what it was a decade ago. That's what it is now, plus or minus uh, maybe a percent or two. So when you see it going from 258 to million to 481 million in 10 years, that is eye-popping. But it reflects the overall size of the city getting uh, a lot bigger um, during that time period. Hopefully, we're going to get that slide up, oh, and right. um, either way, it's going to be posted online. Um, now, the next topic I was going to talk that I am going to talk about has to do with how much of that sales tax makes it to what's called our general fund to pay for everyday expenses and salaries, and goes to the school budget and um, police and fire and garbage pickup, and how much of it gets. Um, sidetracked for public finance projects. And this is a thing where um, there's almost nowhere to find accurate information. And, and frankly, every time there's a campaign for mayor, uh, depending on which candidate you are, you um, tend to um, exaggerate this topic one way or the other. It's been exaggerated by some in different campaigns that it was too large a share of sales tax being directed toward um, public finance projects. Other people feel like it's completely in line and it's difficult to get the facts on that. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping that we get this here's, here's slide up in a second. Help is so on I'm going to pause right there. Hi, Rosie. Thank you. I'm going to try it. Look at you. Good job. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> Miss Rosie who keeps us all. And Rosie fun. is running two business, two two meetings Please. simultaneously now, yes. so. We appreciate you running back and forth. Thank you. All right. So, folks, this is the first slide I described where the um, top row shows what is the maximum allowed by state law, 7% for the state, 2.75 for local option. And then the bottom line is what we have actually in effect here, 7% for the state. Doesn't, does, we never see it for a second here. State collects it, state keeps it. And the 2.25% that the state collects and then um, gives to us. Um, the next slide, this is the one where I guess in, in the room the numbers are going to be hard to read, but um, hopefully you can see the, um, the axis on the left that, that shows over 10 years going from about $250 million to almost $500 million with a local option sales tax collected. And then this is a slide I was about to talk about, um, examples of um, sales tax being used in public finance. Um, and, and not going to the general fund to pay for the sort of everyday services that um, people want and, want and need. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the 
top part, I've got examples of local option sales tax being used in state finance, in public finance. And the bottom, there's examples where the state of Tennessee's share of sales tax is being used. And theoretically, we in Nashville care more about our local option uses. And if the state wants to invest their part of sales tax into a project, theoretically, we should smile and say thank you and, and be okay with that. Um, so let's talk about the uses of local option first. And you'll see the first two examples are um, Sound Stadium and Stocker Stadium. For the ballpark, um, the state Sound Stadium, it's the local option sales tax generated in the ballpark itself are used to support payments on the bonds that were used to build the Sound Stadium. And the argument you get from public finance people is that if you didn't have a ballpark there, you wouldn't have any sales tax there. So it's fair game to use a sales tax generated in the building to support the bonds to build the building. Soccer deal is a little bit different. Um, there, it's the local option sales tax generated at the fairgrounds campus are being used to support the construction um, uh, revenue bonds. And there too, the same argument is made that um, the lion's share of the sales tax coming out of the entire campus are gonna are going to happen because there's a fancy new stadium there and new mixed use um, residential and uh, bars restaurants. And so it's fair to use that local option sales tax to pay for those construction bonds. I don't know what I was thinking, but I forgot the Titan Stadium on that. The Titan Stadium deal is like the Sound Stadium, where it's sales tax generated, the local option sales tax generated inside the building um, are uh, used to support um, paying the bonds. And there's a little um, tidbit to tuck away for the future. If you, if you follow um, the news stories about the development of the East Bank, um, you, you know that there's a vision that has what's currently parking lots being something other than parking lots um, in the future. And so while today we only use the local option sales tax for the building, because there really aren't any sales from the parking lots, um, you know, does that present opportunities or challenges um, if the what's parking lots today becomes sales tax generating properties in the future. I'll pose that as a question just for folks to think about a few months down the road if we get a, um, a Titan Stadium or East Bank um, plan proposed to us by the administration. The Music City Center, let's talk about that one next. Um, that uses um, local option sales tax um, from the convention center um, footprint itself and the Omni Hotel um, to pay the long-term uh, debt to build the place. And also um, uh, sales tax dollars are implicated on something called a tourism development zone, which we'll talk about in a little bit. As far as pros and cons, I've alluded to it. You know, it's um, the, the pro is that, hey, there's these $100 million plus projects that would not be there, would not be generating sales tax in any way, shape, or form. They just wouldn't be there. And so it's completely reasonable to use new sales tax revenue generated by um, exciting new projects to help build the projects. That's the pro. The, the con that you hear sometimes is that the, the universe of sales tax um, that people in the county and visitors are going to pay it's not unlimited. It, it's not unlimited. It doesn't grow on a tree. There's a certain amount of sales tax that's going to be generated. And if you take sales tax from one part of town where Metro gets all the local option money into the budget to spend on schools, roads, fire, police, and you build something fancy that moves that sales tax revenue, a family spending dollars instead of going bowling, buying Titans tickets, have you moved local option sales tax dollars from the budget to financing bond deals. And that's, you know, different people feel different ways about that. Um, but, but I think most people would agree there's not, there's not unlimited sales tax dollars. And you have to at least ask whether you're really generating new sales tax dollars or whether you're moving them from a place where you get it in the budget to a place where you don't get it in the budget. 
Um, and there's probably, you know, the, the whole truth is somewhere probably in between. Okay, um, so now examples of the state of Tennessee um, using its sales tax in public finance. Um, that happens for the Music City Center in the form of a tourism development zone, which, you know, God bless any of you who are paying attention to this uh, because um, it's, uh, it sometimes gets mentioned in media stories. It's, it's very little understood. Um, first thing I'm going to do is show you a drawing of the tourism development zone that supports the Music City Center. And um, this is not a high-tech drawing. To my knowledge, um, this is the drawing of the Tourism Development Zone, sometimes called TDZ. I am not aware of it being on a website. I'm not aware of it being digitally anywhere. This is what was attached to some legislation in 2010 um, for the financing package for the convention center. And it's gonna, it's hard to read if you're staring at it with a, uh, um, a magnifying glass. But basically, hopefully you can work out that um, on the right-hand side of the image, you've got the river is the boundary, and then you've got the interstate loop um, below at the bottom. It um, zigzags out to Vanderbilt, and um, the bottom left corner is West End and 440. Then the um, far left is 440 up to Charlotte, um, back into the downtown area. And it's also important to mention that the dark shaded areas are excluded from the tourism development zone. So um, Centennial Park out west is excluded. Some NES property is excluded. What was residential in 2010 has been excluded um, from the tourism development zone. And it is also super important, if you want to get in the weeds on this, to understand that this is a creation of state law. Um, Metro proposed a tourism development zone um, for the convention center. The state didn't like the boundaries. State changed the boundaries. This is, this is their drawing. Um, so what happens with the tourism development zone? The tourism development zone looks at what the baseline of sales tax was in 2010 and for this area. And sales tax above that baseline gets used to pay the bonds on the convention center. Now, you know, again, you get people on all sides of this, but, you know, the city has grown a lot over 10 years. So just imagine the increase in sales tax in this area. Um, you should also know that the, um, the state adjust that baseline every year for the overall growth in, in the county. So if the overall county had a 5% increase in sales tax, that baseline for the TDZ um, that, that got set in 2010 gets bumped up by that 5% every year. And it's just, uh, again, uh, the amount above that baseline goes. I know this is complicated stuff. Let me try to put some numbers on it in the next slide. Um, this is a report from the convention center that went to the council um, during budget season 2019, and um, hopefully it's readable. You can see um, six different fiscal years there, and you can see a column for local option sales tax from the TDZ, the state side, and then the total. Um, so all this money is going to support the bonds on the convention center. Um, and you'll see that Roughly three quarters of it is the state's money. Um, uh, that column that says state and it's got an $87.9 million total at the bottom. The local option sales tax um, that were used uh, for these six fiscal years to support the convention center was $12.2 million. And just trying to put some context on that, um, remember a couple slides ago for um, you can't you can't read it well from there, but the number um, for the sale, local option sales tax revenue in 2019 was 450 million. So of the 450 million in local option sales tax that came in in 2019, if you go back to this slide, 12.2 million of that 450 went to came off the top went to go pay for convention center debt. Um, and again, you can get people on all sides um, saying, well, you know, this is horrible. Um, you know, that 12.2 million could have been used for a whole bunch of stuff, teacher raises, um, 
fire equipment, a lot of things. And then folks on the other side would say, wow, 12.2 million out of 450 million. So that's a couple percent, um, you know, for all the um, good that we've gotten um, for the convention center um, being here, you know, a couple percent of an increase in um, uh, sales tax over that time period. Sure, that's a good investment. Um, that's a good way to fund it. Um, and, and again, you get people on all sides of it. Um, I've tried before to see exactly um, between the stadiums and the Music City Center to figure out exactly how much of um, that total local option um, sales tax revenue comes, as I put it, off the top to finance these deals. Um, and it's, uh, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty in the weeds on Metro's finances, and it's not compiled anywhere. Um, the only way to really do it is to hit the um, uh, separate fin annual financial audits for the sports authority, the convention center, and Metro to really dial it in. And, and so I, I, don't, I don't really have a good answer for that. I do, um, I offer this example of um, at least how it works with a convention center to show that us using uh, local option sales tax in part to support the convention center construction, you know, is a 3% uh, uh, or so of our sales tax revenue in fiscal 2019, just um, as one data point. And with that, Council Member Allen, that's all I have for my presentation. Thank you. That's excellent information. I appreciate that. Are there, are there any questions on uh, index cards to be picked up? I see one. Thank you very much, Mr. Passano. And while he's, uh, while that question is coming up, Mr. Mendez, can you confirm, as I understand it from that, that um, chart that you showed, all 9.25% of the sales tax above the base is, is going to pay the MCC Music City Center uh, bond debt. Is that With With the understanding that the base gets adjusted annually by the state. So it's not locked in at the 2010 number. It's the, the baseline is a 2010 number adjusted annually for what the overall sales tax growth in the county overall has been, if that makes gotcha. sense. Gotcha. And I know at one point that had built up a pretty healthy reserve and there was some discussion about, you know, whether, whether we could use that reserve to solve other problems in the city. Um, and actually it did sort of help us coast through COVID um, when that came up, do you have any comments on that question? Well, the um, yes, the the topic for today is um, sales tax, um, and and appropriately so. You know, property tax is about half the money that comes in that for the city. Sales tax is about twenty percent, and then we start getting to. Um, taxes where we uh, you make money on the sale of alcohol and the sale of hotel rooms and and uh, short-term rentals and the revenue streams end up trickling down um, to pretty small amounts and it's important to know for the convention center it's it's not just the TDZ sales tax that's going to um, pay for the convention center um, there is a batch of other things that I'm about to find. Like hotel, motel tax, and some rental car assessments as well, am I, if I'm remembering right. Yes. Um, so the total, the total list of things that go into supporting the convention center's bonds are tourism development zone revenues, which we just talked about, airport departure taxes, rental car taxes, $2 uh, per room night, uh, one-third, um, a, a portion of um, hotel motel taxes. Um, the we talked about sales tax, two different things. The um, the campus hotel sales tax re redirect number, um, and then operating revenues from the convention center. And so let's talk about the the two different flavors of sales tax use. So there's there's the um, at the, the top half of this, um, uh, on this slide where it mentions the Music City Center, where some local option sales tax related to the convention center campus and the Omni are used to pay the bond debt. In tw fiscal 2018, that was 19.4 million. 
and in that same year, the TDZ revenue was this $27.6 million number you see here. So two different, um, two different taps on sales tax went to help pay the convention center debt. And then after that, the hotel motel tax um, uh, used is about $26 million that year. And the room nights um, tax is about $14 million. And then the airport and rental car things are, are low. It's just $1 or $2 million each. Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, I will just say it, during, during the COVID year when all of a sudden none of those taxes were being paid initially and they slowly began to trickle back in, um, I think we were grateful that we hadn't rated that reserve as much as had been talked about. But Well, um, that's, you know, that's definitely the case. The, uh, um, the, the sales tax redirect for the campus and the hotel um, was was down a fair amount um, during the COVID year, and they needed their reserve. Um, if you're going to be in a seasonal business like the convention center is, and subject to ups and downs in the economy and wars and disasters, um, having a healthy reserve is appropriate for a project like that. Served as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Swar, you have, I think, a question from the audience. Um, there are two questions. The Great. first one is, how close are we from paying off the Titans, Sound, so uh, the Soccer Stadium, and the Music City Center construction bonds? <coughs> and then the second question is, so once we pay off the construction bonds, where does the sales tax go upon completion? All right, I forget what national politician had the Straight Talk Express. Um, this is going to be the Straight Talk Express. I mean, this is this is not out of uh, no mayor's office would have this in the PR release. Um, so uh, let's talk about soccer first. We essentially haven't started paying the bonds yet. The thing's not built yet. So that one, you know, thirty years, um, twenty five years, I forget which one. Um, on the what were the, it was Titans okay, and sound. yeah. Um, so Titans, um, that stadium was built, opened in 1999. I think the financing was done in the late 90s, 97, 98. It was 30 year bonds. And so they come due, um, they, they would, the original bonds would be paid off, I think by 2028 or so, 2029. And that no coincidence is when the end of the Titans lease is. And so one can expect, I think, that if you have a um, 25, 30-year-old stadium where you would theoretically are looking at paying off bonds, um, somebody is going to want to do something to the stadium to improve it. And, um, and, and, and surely there are going to be new bonds to cover that. So we're not going to have some... I don't think we're, we're not going to have some big recapture of revenue streams that we can put into the general fund. I think um, it's, it's really going to be about um, using those same revenue streams to do whatever improvements you need to do on a quarter century old stadium. Um, and then the sounds, um, uh, I, I think that that one is, um, I think that one is, we're about five years in um, on that one, and they're probably 25-year bonds too, so there, there's a ways to go on those um, bonds still. But I would expect, you know, I hope, I hope that our stadiums last forever, um, but, you know, I, I don't have high hopes for what happens with the 25-year st old stadium. I, I think it's ridiculous when stadiums get torn down and, and rebuilt entirely. I understand improving them, but tearing them down, I don't, I don't love. So may, maybe we'll get lucky at the Sound Stadium and, uh, and, and, and pay, pay it off and still be able to use it without incurring more bond debt to improve it at that point. I think that's... Your guess is that... Use your mic. Thank you. Uh, so you basically, if I understand, is that once it's paid off, you're thinking that whatever we collect, the problem might go through, might be used for maintenance and upkeep after that. Is that what you're thinking? I I, I think so. Um, I mean, I know the the Titans have, and and a couple administrations in a row have been public over the years about. Um, under the 1999 lease, I think it is, Metro um, 
Metro owes the Titans under that lease a substantial amount of money for improvements um, that are supposedly behind. I'm not up to speed on, on what those are exactly, um, but um, you know, I, th I think there's definitely maintenance that needs for the large stadiums as they become decades old. Well, Again, straight talk express from Bob. Um, no authority for anything, no, no decision making on anything. I fully, fully, fully expect that the convention center gurus in town will say at some point, you know, this building has been awesome for us, but if only it were bigger, we could handle XYZ more awesome things and if you want to have a Super Bowl like this place is barely adequate so let's do more to it and I don't mean to scoff at that um, I know we'll get that pitch someday um, and and I'm I mean I'm I'm game for a conversation whenever that is but um, w when that day happens and it, it might be years down the road still because the building has only been open less than a decade um, when that conversation happens, I will legitimately want to know. I mean, I don't want to get, um, I don't want to get uh, just conned into um, expanding it if it's not really needed. But you know, if there's a pitch that it needs to be expanded to be competitive with whomever for whatever, you know, we could talk about it. But I, I'm sure we'll get that pitch one day in the future from the folks who run convention stuff in town. Good question. Was there a further question or just that? Um, that was just from other questions. Okay, Councilmember Savar. Thank you. Would you speak to, um, I think one of the questions that usually come up during budget season, uh, especially when we're talking about increasing property taxes, one of the things people always talk about is, why don't you guys just increase the sales tax? Why don't you look at other taxes? Would you speak into how much does that usually mean and what is the process, even if we want to think about that? Not advocating for it, but as part of the educational process. Right, um, and I'm gonna um, just do some quick math on my calculator. So, first of all, we need to know that in a two and a half billion dollar budget, um, taking our property tax from, or I'm sorry, our sales tax from 9.25 to 9.75 looks like a, maybe a 25 million dollar difference in revenue. And on a two and a half billion dollar budget, um, that um, isn't super helpful. Um, you, you know, again, the point I was making before about just in, inflation, you know, if you if you do, um, if you look at the inflation that could be expected on our budget, there, there could be a thirty million dollar need um, just to cover pencils costing more and paper costing more. Um, s setting aside um, our commitment to continue to pay our employees a fair wage, and and there's wage increases that use up money. So, with this, with what the state of Tennessee has set up for us, where we are pushed toward property tax and sales tax. We could max out sales tax and it wouldn't cover what we need to cover property tax because of the way the state has made the laws with no income tax. Property tax is the place this city will continue to get the lion's share of its income. And listen, I hate it. Um, sales tax is regressive. Property tax is regressive. Um, it hurts people with lower income. Both taxes hurt people with lower income more. Um, my argument that um, I hope the council and the mayor come up with is for a quarter century from 1980 to two, 2005, the city raised its property tax uh, rate a little bit every three or four years. And 
Uh, Phil Bredesen raised property taxes three times when he was office and got elected governor. Um, you know, if, if you set expectations that the property tax rate is going to get tweaked a little bit every three or four years and then you stick with it and people know to expect it and people can work their lifestyle and expectations around it, it's okay. Um, the system got busted with the 2008 downturn and instead of doing it every three or four years, we did it once after 2005 and, and people um, got used to, people, people do it you know, they get used to things that government does. They got used to their property tax rate not changing. And um, even after the property tax increase of a couple years ago, the overall tax burden in this city for sales tax, property tax, income tax, every other tax is lower than every peer city we've got. Um, and and that shows in being behind on schools, um, capital needs, being behind on just barely trying to, you know, we're, we're, six months into having our teachers um, the best paid in the state. If we, instead of doing it once every decade like we did for a while, would actually do it every three or four years like Fulton did, like um, Bill Boner did, like Bredesen did, like Purcell did, um, then we, we'd we be further ahead on taking care of these everyday needs. So um, I, I know I answered more than what you asked, but um, that got me on one of my things. Like, there's not enough room in, in sales tax to make a big difference, and we have to be committed to, the state says property tax is how we raise money, um, then, like, by God, like, we need to make sure we can uh, pay for what we need to do with property tax. Thank you. I think we have run a little past our time, so I will say if there are other questions, please email us and we'll, we'll try to answer them that way. We hope this has been helpful. Uh, we hope that people will continue to uh, to show up on Wednesdays and Thursdays at 6, um, and we'll uh, we'll talk in the new year about where we are spending this money on um, and, uh, and how we do our best to be good stewards of that. So thank you so much, and this meeting is adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.